Occupy Wall Street is not a mass movement of the entire American society, but certain classes of the society who are becoming conscious of a dysfunction. They are becoming conscious of a dysfunction. There's a yearning of the consciousness that recognizes that there is something wrong when 1% of the society owns most of the wealth. But it doesn't stop there. When that 1% of the society, when it becomes clear and clear that they are the ones who ultimately decide who the rulers are and who the people can choose for their rulers, this time, for the first time since the Great Depression, the middle classes of society, and mostly white middle class, let's be frank, have been affected in a way that they have not been affected before. Therefore, money controls the complete American political process. Is that the Occupy Wall Street movement needs to avoid being pigeonholed into the traditional media cultivated categories of left and right. Because if it falls into that, it will only appeal to a very narrow segment of the society. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Well, today we are on the site of the American Awakening, European Awakening Conference here at the University of Tehran in Tehran, Iran. Very happy to be joined by a special guest today. Um, welcome to Iran, first of all. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. Well, can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. My name is Heather Gottney, and I'm an assistant professor of sociology at Fordham University in New York City. Okay. Um, what brings you here? Tell me about why are you participating in this conference? There's, a, as you know, a mass movement in the United States that I've been following very closely and, um, and participating in. Uh, and I was invited by the University of Tehran to uh, participate in this conference. And uh, we were uh, sent a, a list of questions that people had about the movement. And I thought that we could do a very good job of answering those questions and providing details that might not be available through uh, media sources or, you know, to provide a first-hand account of what's been going on. Well, let's talk about the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. Mm -hmm. uh, now it has been going on uh, since September. Uh, there were those that thought during the winter months that it would actually lose its flow and basically fall apart. And though it has been difficult, it seems that they're still holding on. What is the difference between this movement and being able to have that sustainability and perhaps other demonstrations or movements that we have had in the United States in the past? I think there are a couple of important differences. Uh, first of all, the previous movements that we've seen, the anti-war movement or the global justice movement, did not attract such large segments of the American population. And part of that is a function of the fact that uh, the housing crisis and recession begun in 2008, even a little earlier, really affected a, a large number of Americans. And people have been uh, disappointed, I think, with the government's ability to solve these problems. And so they're using the streets as an avenue for political expression. Um, I think the... The, the primary form of protest early on were the camps, and that's a very, very uh, difficult form of protest to, to sustain. It's 24-hour sure. kind of protest, and not everyone can engage in that. But the movement has found ways to engage and in, um, in pressure uh, uh, politicians and, and people in power at an institutional level, and that kind of work has been, ha, it remains ongoing, mm -hmm. even though many of the camps have been cleared. Do you think now it's entering a new phase? As you talked about the first phase, which was the camps, mm -hmm. and now you're saying that they're trying to pressure politicians or looking at uh, other directions to go in. Um, are we entering a new phase of the Occupy movement? And how successful do you think that they will be at... Uh, trying to pressure the politicians? I think that the that there is indeed a new phase. I think the movement has moved fairly decisively away from this camp form of protest. Uh, the move into social institutions and into the political realm, I think, is, is very crucial because this movement is a very decentralized movement that coalesces around local concerns and wants to take a kind of direct approach in trying to, to inject people 
power, right, or people's opinions right. into our social institutions like public education, for example, or health care. In terms of pressuring politicians, we've seen a lot of activity just in the primaries and the early caucuses of occupiers showing up and pressuring uh, Republican candidates to address issues of concern, address issues of inequality. Um, and I think that, that we're going to see a continuation of that as, the, as, as we lead into the November elections, for sure. Okay, well, let's talk about that whole political process, because we know that the main slogan is that we are the 99%. And uh, if that is the psyche going into this, that we are the 99%, do the people believe that they can make implemental uh, changes into the political system because obviously there's something wrong with the system yeah. in general that it has reached this point. So do they believe that through these uh, demonstrations or protests that they will be able to make those implemental changes that are needed? I think at a grassroots level, yes. I think part of the, there's a group for example called Occupy the DOE and the DOE is the Department of Education and what they've been doing is showing up at meetings and either disrupting them or trying to engage people's voices in them as a way to democratize the decision-making process more generally when it comes to uh, our, our education system. So I, there is that kind of you know activity that I, I think people can make changes in terms of injecting their voices in at the institutional level. At the national level, we've seen some impact already. So recently, uh, Eric Schneiderman, who is, uh, you know, has become Obama's leading man in prosecuting the banks, and that was not something, and he has given direct credit to the Occupy movement and said this would not be possible if there was not a mass movement behind me. And so now they're really, you know, there was a settlement to for um, the the federal government is going to give money back to states, which is supposed to go straight to people who lost their homes. Mm -hmm. But the other issue is that that's not a settlement that um, that prevents criminal prosecution, and so there is a, an an, uh, an investigation that just begun into the criminal aspect of the housing crisis, mm -hmm. and again. That would not have been possible if it wasn't for this movement. So despite the fact that they're not trying to pressure uh, the national government in terms of making uh, strict policy demands, there have been these, these kind of um, uh, successes okay. in, in, that, that the movement can claim. Well, let's look at it. It was interesting for me at the beginning of... Uh the movement with the Times Square occupation, mm -hmm. that some of the signs were saying from Tahrir to Times Square. Yeah. That international connection of the movement, this is rare in the United States because we know that in the country itself, basically, there hasn't been a whole lot of connection on the grassroots movements with what is happening outside of the borders of the U.S. How significant is this development? I think it's, it's very important. Um, there was, as an activist in the global justice movement in the late 90s, we were small, but we were concerned with issues of the World Trade Organization and the IMF, but it was very limited. Right. And now you're seeing a much larger connection and concern internationally. And of course, the Egyptian uprising was a, was a huge inspiration, but also um, some of the activity in Europe was inspirational as well. And I think what all of these movements and the movement in the United States share is a desire for real democracy, to use the slogan of the, of the Spanish 15 May movement, a desire for real democracy now. Um, and certainly uh, that was inspirational for people in the United States. And, and actually in Spain they also had the camps. And so the form was an inspiration, but I would say the largest was the was the Egyptian was and Tunisian uprisings where the, of course, set the world on fire, not just the United States. Right, yeah. right. Well, there often is uh, some comparisons with the American people, and let's say you just talked about the Europeans. Mm -hmm. The Europeans seem to be more politically aware. Mm -hmm. If we look at you just talked about Spain, and of course we've seen in France, and now we're seeing Greece and Italy and so many other countries, that they seem to be on the streets immediately yeah. when they hear about tougher austerity policies or another decision of the government that they do not like, 
they take to the streets. Yes. However, that is not usually the case in the United States. Yes. What is the difference? You're a sociologist, so tell me. About this. <laughs> well, there are a lot of distractions. <laughs> first of Maybe. all, yeah, there there are a lot of things to distract people from from taking to the streets. As you said, there isn't this culture. Um, we have had a, a real slowly decaying trade union. Um, system in our country and in Europe a lot of the activity does emanate from trade unions um, and and that our trade unions are also very uh, split you know we have unions that are, are very interested in, in um, you know more progressive politics but we also have ones that are fairly conservative and so you don't you don't have a unified labor movement uh, that you have in Europe um, and I, but I also think that politically there was a lot of uh, hope with the Obama administration that, that he was going to usher in a kind of new change. generation. Yeah, and, and he, um, I think beginning with the bailout, many people were disappointed with his performance, and then of course this, you know, continued. And in some ways, I, I, my prediction is that he's going to go back into a more progressive direction because his movement is giving him some of the ability to do that. But, uh, but the problem is also, you know, that we have a huge, the corporations control so much of what goes on politically in the country. Um, but in terms of the American people, I think that they're, I mean, it's difficult to speak for such a diverse country, you know, but Again, I think that some of it does have to do with the with the fact that people w work a great deal. You have most of my students are full time students, and then they work right. over more than part time. They don't have the the luxury that student students had. That you, uh, many movements are, are are led by students, right? right? The student movements, and we don't have that situation because they're they don't have the time. Yeah, they're overwhelmed. Um, but now, you know, another factor is that we have had a high rate of unemployment. And when you have unemployed people, they have the time and availability to protest. Right. And when people are kept working and kept entertained, then they don't, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I think that some of those, those, uh, those, that part of the American social contract has sort of fallen apart at mm -hmm. this point. And, and people are looking for ways to express themselves and they, they, they don't feel like they have that. Right. Future of the movement in your perspective, where do you see this going? I think that there's going to be um, a continuation of the pressure and with trying to reclaim social institutions for everyday people. I think that we're going to see some interesting activity around the elections. I think that the movement is going to pressure all candidates, not just Republican, not just Democratic. I think you're going to see a a lot of activity around that. Um, we have the G8 coming in uh, in the spring, and I think we're going to see large protests there, and at the Republican and Democratic national conventions. And uh, some people are talking about in the spring starting up the camps again, so we could see some of that activity. Um, so I think that you're going to see Occupy continue for quite a while until there until m many more of the of the concessions you know or the demands that are in a, you know not directly being made by the movement are met right do you think that with the occupy movement that we have we're in the process of seeing a change in the american psyche in general more um, awakening more of being involved in, uh, in politics and in looking at the world in a different perspective. I do think so. I do think that, that there is, even in New York, you know, we had this large camp called Zuccotti Park, and the camp started to attract people who'd never protested before, who never dreamed of, of going into the streets to express themselves politically um, or, or to it, it even develop those, those kind of relationships um, or who never dreamed that politics could be something that would could could be discussed or developed in a community at a grassroots level. And so I think that there are quite quite many people, especially young people, who have not done this kind of thing before um, and who are increasingly interested. And, and there's also the social media attracts, uh, is, is very attractive. Right. Um, a lot of people have been experimenting with that and connecting with that. And uh, it's proven to be a wonderful way of exchanging ideas 
And um, I think that's also been crucial to this, is, is the, the kind of information exchange and development of an independent media. Oh, my gosh. Um, and uh, I think that's been, um, been, been something that's brought people into this movement. There is, I'll add also, a, it's a very playful movement. And there's been a lot of artistic expression and a lot of playfulness. A lot of celebrities have been attracted to this. And so the thing that usually catches the eye of, of American youth and, I mean, American people in general has been, has been kind of co-opted by the movement. You know, instead of allowing the, the, um, the movement to be co-opted, uh, it's sort of, I think, worked in the reverse. And so it's, a, it's been a fun, I mean, there's been certainly a lot of confrontation with police and terrible things, but there's been a lot of uh, playfulness within the movement that I think has, has also, you know, made it an enjoyable thing to be a part of, you know, a kind of fulfilling thing, but also fun. Well, let's talk about, you just talked about the confrontation with police, because we have seen um, a lot of that, especially on the West Coast, especially Oakland, yeah. California. Why? Yeah, I mean, the there is, um, I think that the um, one of the other professors at this conference who specializes in this, but he, um, you know, one of his positions is that Despite the small numbers in some places, the movement has had a very contentious kind of um, kind of character. And so, instead of kind of staying between the lines of, and that are laid out by the state in terms of uh, demonstrations and things like that, people really push the barriers. And um, and I think that that especially in New York City, which is a, a highly a very expensive and highly privatized city. Um, Occupying these public spaces, where the, they're not really public spaces, but trying to occupy spaces um, becomes very threatening to the social order. Mm -hmm. And so, I think that one of the reasons why we've seen that kind of um, those kind of clashes is because of the level of um, confrontation that the movements engaged in. Okay. Now, on the West Coast, um, it's uh, they have a, a history in Oakland of violence. Um, first of all. But also the mayor there did, has, is, she typically comes from a kind of liberal background. Um, but I think she wasn't sure how to handle the situation and it escalated very quickly with the severe injury of a, of a, a former war veteran, a very young man, by the way. And, um, and, I, and I think that it angered people to such a level that they, they actually really um, strengthen the movement, okay. that kind of depression. Time, Heather. Okay. 30 seconds, how optimistic are you about this movement? I'm very optimistic. I think it's in incredibly exciting to see the American uh, people interested in, in politics and interested in grassroots activity. And uh, I think that the movement has a great deal of potential to make um, some significant and much, much, much needed change. All right, fantastic. Thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you. And enjoy your stay here in Iran. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for staying with us. Don't go away. Have a whole lot more to the show to come.